good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so very, very warm welcome to each and uh, every one of you um, to the next uh, Development Studies Seminar. Um, hope you had a good um, reading week. Um, today we are hosting Dr. Kenda Andrews from Birmingham City University. And he will be delivering a talk titled Black Revolution, the Global Politics of Black Radicalism. Um, Dr. Andrews is an associate professor in sociology uh, at Birmingham City University and was previously a lecturer in working with children, young people and families and criminology at Newman University. He completed his PhD in uh, sociology and cultural studies entitled Back to Black, Black Radicalism and the Black Supplementary School Movement um, at the University of Birmingham. In 2013, Kinder published his first book, um, Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality, and the Black Supplementary School Movement. And um, copies of his latest book are also available outside of DLC at discounted price if you're interested. He is now director of the Center for Critical Social Research, and he's the founder of the Organization of Black Unity and co-chair of the Black Studies Association. So we will hear from Dr. Andrews for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have about 10 minutes of remarks from our um, discussant, uh, who is Shabir Laka. Uh, welcome to him as well. He's a writer and activist. He organizes with a number of national campaigns, including against war, austerity, and racism, and for justice for Palestine. He has been centrally involved in the anti-Trump movement, and was part uh, of organizing the demonstration against Trump's visit to the UK earlier this year. Um, so um, after his remarks, then we will open the floor to your questions. And um, two more quick announcements. Um, if you are on Twitter and you would like to tweet about um, today's um, seminar, please do so with the hashtag SOASDevStudies and ESRC. And um, after the um, seminar, you're all uh, welcome to join us for some refreshments, refreshments upstairs at um, SCR. So, um, thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> uh, good evening. Good evening. Good. Good. All right, so, uh, sorry, I'm in the middle of eating this really nice muffin. <laughs> it's really nice. I like um, but it's actually not, it's, it is also relevant uh, to the tool, funnily enough. Uh, so, the end of the book, the book, the book is Back to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century. And if you want to get a signed copy, <coughs> I'm around afterwards. And the, what, I'm gonna, what I really want to stress is a couple of things. Why, what black radicalism is, why black radicalism is necessary. And actually for a number of you, this will, really, this will hopefully resonate. How many of you, this is a development studies series, how many of you are studying development. Uh, you're going to love it. All right. So, <laughs> okay, so um, yeah. So, all right. The premise of black radicalism of the book, of, of the outlook that you're going to hear today, is simply that it's already too late. Right? And it's already too late. Sounds a bit pessimistic, right? Like, it's already too late. We're stuck. We're done. But it actually is anything but. That really is the mantra of radical politics. That is a part, I've taken that from Malcolm X. I will give you a, a trigger warning if you go Malcolm X. There's a lot of Malcolm X is going to be today. Uh, in fact, there is a drinking game where if you drink every time I say Malcolm, uh, I would recommend it, we'll end up very, very inebriated. Um, so I've already started, started straight away with Malcolm. It's already too late. What does he mean by it's already too late? What he means is he's not saying it's already too late for there to be change. He's saying it's already too late for there to be any real change within our political and economic system, right? To go back to back Malcolm X quotes, he talks about how the, the freedom, justice, and equality for black people is just as impossible in this system as it is for a chicken to lay a duck egg, right? It's just not meant to do it. And what we're trying to do all the time is we're always trying to make a chicken lay a duck egg. We're always trying to find equality and freedom in a system which is never built for us to have equality or freedom, right? Racism is the political system. You can't separate, you literally cannot separate racism from the political system. So how on earth could you possibly imagine 
you could have an anti-racist system. Not possible, right? And I, I do my chocolate. I wasn't going to do my today because I thought I need this lovely muffin. Which reminds me, chocolate is the perfect example, right? There was, I'm from Birmingham, and there was lots of howls of outrage. One, when Cadbury's was taken over by Americans, and obviously Americans are far more, you know, economic superiors than British people, right? So it makes, this makes a big difference. Um, and two, what did, what did they do after they took over? They uh, stopped doing fair trade, right? So fair trade, Cadbury's no longer buys fair trade chocolate. What's the problem with that? Fair trade is a complete and utter nonsense. There is no such thing as fair trade. How would you possibly have fair trade in the system? And chocolate is the perfect example. So I went to anybody been to Birmingham? Yeah? Anybody been Cabri Cabri World? Cabri World? If you go Cabri World, I recommend you go because it is the best description of neo-colonial economics you will ever see anyway. It's literally a celebration of neo-colonialism. They have this uh, museum where they talk to you about the history of the company and they say well, how chocolate's made and all this stuff. And it starts off uh, where they found chocolate. So where they came across chocolate was the Spanish and the Aztecs, right? And they sort of mention, they kind of mention that the Spanish may have killed a few of the Aztecs. <laughs> they sort of gloss over the fact there was a mass killing there, and we don't talk about that. But they you know, killed Montezuma, etc., etc. Then, after they've discovered, discovered chocolate, just like they discovered uh, the New World, uh, <laughs> they kind of fast forward, like slavery has no mention. Imagine a chocolate factory with no mention of slavery. What is the second most important ingredient for chocolate? Sugar, right? Where does sugar, like, I don't believe that sugar grows in Birmingham. <laughs> sugar is, it, sugar was the very first thing that was refined using the steam engine. And where did they get the sugar from? They got the sugar from slave labor. You can't tell the story of chocolate, really, historically, without the story of, sla of slavery. Because this is where the commodity came from. Uh, however, they managed to do this, completely skipped through slavery, because, because Cadbury was founded after slavery formally ended, so obviously it doesn't really matter, right? Same as with Tate and Lyle. Uh, was it the Tate? The Tate? Yeah, it was the Tate recently. I didn't even realize the Tate was the Tate, the sugar beet. Uh, didn't even realize that, no, no revolution. And they had this similar argument. Ah, uh, well, it was founded after slavery, so we don't have anything to do. <coughs> Where did they get their money from? Where did they get their resources from? How do we even get sugar in the so slavery is absolutely important to the story, but it's also completely missed out from uh, the Cabin World experience. I guess it wouldn't really be that much of an attraction uh, to put slavery as one of the key parts of the, of the talk. So fair enough. Anyway, after, so after the um, finding of the chocolate, they go to the establishment of the factory. So Cadbury's have a very good reputation in Birmingham because they were a really good employer. So Bourneville in Birmingham, we've been to Birmingham, Bourneville, is still one of the nicest parts of the city. It was purposely built for the factory workers. They had a swimming pool. They had a six-day week, which was good, which, which was good for those times. Um, they had healthcare, stuff like that. It was, really, it was like a, a garden city, paradise, sort of paradise, for their workers. And because of that, Cadbury's uh, has lots and lots and lots of ratings and credibility within the city of Birmingham, and they celebrate this hugely in the uh, museum. So 19th century, great conditions for factory workers. But guess who they completely and utterly ignore in the chocolate chain of production? The Ghanaian farm workers, who basically, who basically produced the, the cocoa, picked the cocoa, in conditions very similar to slavery. Right? This is actually one of the, this shows you one of the very limits of social democracy. Right? So you have this great working class, wonderful conditions for white workers, secure <laughs> off what? The back of exploiting resources from Ghana. That, this, that is what social democracy really is. Uh, a warning about uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, I say vote Corbyn, it's definitely better than the alternative, but if you believe that social democracy is a panacea for racism, my dad came to this country under social democracy, if anything it was more racist then than it is now. Right? Social democracy does not end racism in any way. In fact, social democracy is often how do we share the spoils of our colonial inventions better. Right? That's the discussion that we're having. And Cadbury was a perfect example. So anyway, they said that, they have this whole Cadbury's, aren't they wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Then they come to nowadays, modern day, modern day period. And I'm not joking, you have to, you have to go and watch the video. They have, and the video has been the same for the last, at least the last 30 years. Because I've been here, I went the first long time. And it's this black and white video uh, with a white gentleman with a, one of those colonial pimp, 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 p
waiting, and he doesn't say this, but he may as well say this, the happy, smiling Africans chop down the cocoa, and they put it on boats, and it goes over to uh, the brick, right? So the people who paid pittance, who literally paid nothing, to chop the cocoa down. This is Ghana's resource, right? This is Ghana's natural product. He's chopped for nothing, sent off to factories in Birmingham, and somewhere else up north, it's been processed, it's made into chocolate, it's made into a commodity, a commodity that your average um, cocoa farmer could never afford to buy in their entire life. Right? That's that little money they make. They can't ever afford to buy a bar of chocolate. Right? That is neocolonial economics. We, Britain, make money from the resources of Africa and actually try to then sell that stuff back to Africa. Right? Taking the cocoa, processed it, made it a product, and made billions upon billions upon billions of pounds. So yes, Birmingham's doing well, Britain's doing well, but what about Ghana? Ghana's doing terribly, yeah. So that's why I say, if you talk about fair trade in that context, you're talking nonsense. There's no such thing. It's not possible to have fair trade with that relationship. That is a neo-colonial relationship which Nkrumah, uh, the first president of Ghana, said had an Alice in Wonderland craziness about it. Right? And if you look at the actual African continent, that is one of the ways in which inequality is perpetuated again and again and again and again. Why is Africa so poor? Africa is so poor because its natural resources are literally stolen out of the ground. I mean, it's some like Nigeria, all of its share oil fields are owned by Shell. I mean, Nigeria doesn't even own its own oil field. It's mad. Like, just think about that for a second. Right? This is the world we live in. So, if we're in this political economic system, how can you possibly expect this to provide you with equality? And this is why I say it's already too late. It's not possible. What the West is built on racism. It is built, the actual, what is the founding moment of the West? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? Went, thought he was going somewhere else, bumped into the Americas, and that really is the founding point of the West. That, without that happening, there is no Western industrial capital. It happen, right? It was important for expansion, it was important for materials, it was important for slavery, it was important for money. That really is the founding point of the West. And at that founding point of the West, what happened when Columbus stumbled onto the Americas? Is there a, you know, a, 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 a trading relationship formed? Is there like, you know, we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a nice, um, we'll use the land, you use the land. No, there was a complete genocide, extermination of a huge amount of people. I, I, this is one of the things that we don't teach well at all. I was surprised. I'm currently writing a book about it, and they reckon the midpoint estimate of people who lived in the Americas, from Canada to South America, to the Caribbean, is a hundred million people. That's the midpoint. So it could be higher, it could be lower. Right? 100 million people. Within a generation, 96. 96% 96 of people <coughs> were dead. Right? This is a genocide which is unparalleled in human history. This is just death on a scale which you've never seen. Right? My family's from Jamaica, and there are no native people there. Right? People say, yeah, but no, there's not. Gone. Literally gone. Right? Just Columbus. Uh, so Columbus was predominantly, when he went back, went to what we think of as Dominican Republic and Haiti. Within 10 years, their population was reduced from 8 million, midpoint estimate, to less than 20,000. Well, so imagine, imagine the scale of death and torture. Right, huge. So that's the founding principle of the West, the founding point. Then you have slavery, remember slavery? Sugar, <laughs> cotton, etc. We don't have all the wealth that we have today is built on this trade. I mean, it's literally just, and again, you go back to Birmingham, but I'm Birmingham here today. Uh, we have the three, what they call the Golden Boys. James Watt, Matthew Bolton, somebody else. <laughs> I can't remember. We'll come back to it. But they have a statue in the city, and it's one of their anniversaries for next year. But they all look alike to me, so I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't remember which one. <laughs> I think it's James Watt. And they're going to have this whole celebration, and you would you, you would learn about their, their industrial exports. They actually did A level history and learned about the Industrial Revolution. I was actually told when I asked, well, where did they get the cotton from? Seems a bit suspicious, well, I was in war. I was actually told that, you know, because, well, forget that, forget the slavery stuff. It's not in the textbooks, so why are you thinking about it? Right? That's, that's the level of education you get in our schools. But in the narrative of Birmingham, you would never hear anything about slavery. Because Birmingham wasn't a port, it's not Bristol, it's not Liverpool, uh, it's not London, you know, we don't hear that, right? It's, we, we just did in industry. Because we're just great, great men who did these great things, wonderful things. And miss out the fact that all of their money, all of their investments, all of their profit was, how did they do this? It was slavery. 300 years of that trade produced all the wealth on which we currently reside. Right? I mean, the, mad, the maddest thing uh, we, we uh, came across in the last few years was the reparations. So slavery was so, so uh, 
um, economically beneficial to the West, to Britain particularly. Now, when slavery ended, they did actually give reparations, right, to the poor, damaged slave owners who had to give up their property, which was sold uh, for a living purpose. And reparations was in two forms. One form was the enslaved actually had to work for free for four years, what they called apprenticeship. So they actually, they actually paid reparations themselves. Imagine that you're a slave and you're paying reparations yourself. The other way reparations were paid uh, was with the biggest payment made outside of wartime by the government until the financial crisis. It's a grand about 20 million pounds in today's money, um, but it was just a huge, for that time it was a huge payment, huge payment. The payment was so large that they owed, they had to loan the money back from the Bank of England. And did anybody know when they finished loaning the money back? The government finished paying the money back this reparation to slave owners? 2015. 2015, which means that every one of you in this room <coughs> paid reparations to slave owners. Imagine that, imagine, if you really imagine that you actually paid, I paid, my parents paid reparations to slave owners. Right? That's the system in which we live. So don't tell me that slavery happened a long time ago. Right? That's not something happened a long time ago. Now we, we only finished up paying reparations for slave owners today. Uh, and let alone reparations for the people who actually suffered from slavery. So I say all this to remind us that we have a system which is fundamentally built on racism. It cannot, it cannot do anything other than it does. Right? The radical analysis is an analysis uh, that, I mean, there's broadly two ways to look at the world. Is. There's more than complicated this but Generally, you have a, lib a liberal tradition that will, that I can list off statistics about racism. And I think we all agree that racism exists. Hopefully, we all agree. You never know, you never know. Never know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all agree that racism exists. And it's one of the ways to explain this, to say, well, look, let's look at employment figures, let's look at, let's look at health, let's look at all these things. We look at all these things, right? And we can say, this is, a, this is because the system doesn't work. Right? This is a liberal tradition. There's something wrong with the system, and if we fix it, we tweak it, and we can, we can eventually, the system will work properly, and everything will be fine, and we can have equality. That's the liberal tradition. That is, if we're honest, most of our political endeavor, right? Something can be fixed and changed. Usually, that looks like access. So can, you know, can black people get access to the system? Can we get a black president, maybe? Uh, can we get black CEOs? Can we get black people in politics? Can we get black people into the system? So often, there's a focus on voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. And once we're in the system, uh, then we, we do things differently. The black police commissioner will obviously act differently than the white police commissioner. Right? In this logic, at least. So, that's, that's, that's the idea, right? And you can do to pick, to pick what he thinks. So, the radical analysis is very different, right? The radical analysis looks at this problem and says that the reason you have these inequalities is not because the system is broken, but because this is the logic of the system. In fact, the inequalities we continue to see, and haven't really got better in any meaningful way uh, in the last 50 or 100 years, is because that's what the system is supposed to do, right? And when you realize the system isn't broken, it's actually functioning at a very high level, then there is only one thing to do, right? Revolution. Get a new system. Do something else. Stop having faith in a system which is about to exploit you. That's what I mean by it's, it's already too late. And it's already too late for, I mean, let's take Africa, Africa, for example, which is the richest continent on the planet, has the most resources by a distance than anywhere else, right? Yet somehow it's the poorest continent on the planet. In fact, if you look at any indicator of global inequality, will maps on almost perfectly to racial hierarchy from the 19th century. What was the racial hierarchy? Based on the idea that Europe, white people are top, right, white supremacy, uh, black people are at the bottom. Uh, people like Linnaeus, who was a Swedish botanist, whose name is actually on a university in Sweden, still a very respected Swedish botanist. In his book, System of the Torah, uh, was written in the 18th century, he talks of, was looking at plants and the species and, and going through all the species of plants, and as part of that, categorized human beings into species. He said, um, at the top was Europaeus Albus, sanguine, white, liberty-loving, governed by law. Then you had Americus Rubiscus, tanned and irascible, governed by custom. Uh, Asiatic Luridus, for the next step down, yellow, melancholy, governed by tradition. And at the very bottom of this hierarchy, you had Afa Niger, crafty, lazy, black, governed by the arbitrary will of the master, right? That's racial hierarchy. But as I said, look at any map of global inequality, and that's pretty much what it looks like, right? Advanced industrial countries, are, apart from Japan, they're all white places, right? Africa's the poorest place, right? And in between, you have these different steps, right? 
that is what he looks like. And at some point you have to realize that's not a coincidence. That didn't just happen randomly. That is by design. Our global economic system is built on white supremacy. That's the point of it. So why are you expecting it to do something other than the thing it's meant to do? It does it very well. Right? So it's already too late for the three million children to die in South East Africa every year because of no reason other than they're poor. That's it. It's not even the poor. It's already too late for the people to die. Like people from, we talk about refugees. Economic refugees should be a category of refugees. We have people fleeing. So the Mediterranean crisis, uh, which we got lots of press because of Syria, has been happening for years. Right? This is majority of people fleeing countries which are stable, that don't have wars. They're just so poor they can't provide for people. Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, fleeing these West African countries, taking the risk to cross the Sahara Desert, which is <coughs> risky enough as it, as it is, crossing through Libya, which is that's now risky as, as anything as well, and then taking the risk to cross the uh, Mediterranean on these makeshift boats, and even then crossing Europe to get here. And that's a level of desperation <coughs> because of the political economic system, right? That's some, something's deeply gone wrong in some of these failures. Or something hasn't gone wrong, that is actually the logic of our system, which makes that fact of communism. So when we have this discussion about should we be treating migrants better, of course you should treat migrants better. But the problem isn't how we treat migrants particularly. The problem is the fact that they need to flee their country for no other reason than poverty in the first place. So how do we fix that problem? And then we don't have the other. There's not really a problem in itself. So that's why it's already too late for me. Now, the reason I asked you about your development studies is because one of the, what do you think one of the key mechanisms of neo-colonialism today is? is I don't even call it education, I'll call it school. How you are schooled, how you are trained, how you are taught, how you know the things that you know, right? That is the main, that is one of the main ways. Alongside colonialism, racism, slavery, etc., always had two facets to them. One of them was force, just brute force. We're gonna kill lots of people, we're gonna chain you, we're gonna do lots of other things. The other thing was soft power, right? It was, we're gonna teach you, we're gonna train you, we're gonna de-Africanize you so you won't feel like you're connected to something else. Uh, we're gonna give you a version this isn't really an anti-Christian argument, it's an anti-Western version of Christianity, which was given to us argument, uh, which was very much about uh, pacifying us and keeping us in our place, etc., etc., and really teaching you to hate everything African or hate everything radical or hate everything revolutionary and learn a particular way of going through, right? And really importantly, the schools are part of that, but universities are just as more complicit, more complicit. Where is it you get the knowledge from that you have in school? From university. When the university teacher, when the, my school teacher was telling me, don't do that, it's not in the textbook, who's putting the stuff in the textbook? Who decides what goes over the curriculum? That comes from university education. Right? There's a reason why teachers, even when they have the opportunity to teach about slavery, teach about um, different parts of the world, don't teach it. Because they're not in the universities they went to, taught it to them. So they don't know anything about it. Right? So they just teach what they know. Europe, Europe, and some more Europe. Right? And maybe America. That's still Europe. So, um, <laughs> so the universities are really fucked. Actually, one of the things that happened now with neocolonialism, and if you attract how neocolonialism works today, um, where did the elite? So we can. There's lots of problems with the elite in Africa, and Asia, other parts of the world. Um, where do they get their training from? Here, right? Which is one of the main places people come to, right? One of the main places here. This actual university people come from Asia, Africa. We come from, uh, probably people in the room today, you probably come from one of these parts of the world to learn how you develop your economy. And I tell you right now, that's the worst possible thing you could ever do. <laughs> 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 because what is it you learn? I don't know we criticize anybody who's literary. So I <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, what is development study is based on is, is based on the principle that the West is an act as is a positive agent in the development of countries. And that's what happens. No, the West is the problem. Like if you actually track why these countries are poor, it's because of the West. The idea of the West is the what is it? What did Rusto say there? Do you still do Rusto? Is Rusto still on the Rusto still on the green? Oh god, then we actually have an evolutionary ladder of development. I mean just the idea of it. It's an evolutionary ladder. The, you know, you, someone comes to the Congo, the problem with the Congo is that the country is backwards and traditional. It needs the West to come in and give you, you know, give you some money, give you a loan, give you the right direction, and you have this precondition to take off. And then you start to have even call the drive to maturity when it starts to get better, and eventually you get the mass high consumption, just like the West. That is a complete fantasy. I mean, honestly, that is a total and utter fantasy. The West 
is built on the exploitation of places like the Congo. Oh, well, we are rich because these places are poor. There is no development in these places while here is rich. Right? This is like the mobile phone. It's always the best example. Right? How do you have a smartphone? This is amazing technology. How is it so cheaply available? That's rare. Because companies will go into the Congo and literally steal the resources out of the ground. Actually, oftentimes get children to go and steal them for them, right? And this makes your commodities very cheap. If the Congo was really at mass high, high consumption, really had all this high standard of living and could charge a proper weight, rate for the materials to make its phone, phone would be too expensive. So you wouldn't have a phone, right? Your whole economy is based on this. You look at your clothes, and the food you produce, everything, everything we have is based on that basic, simple premise. And we exploit from other parts of the world and we get rich off it. So there's no possible route in that, in that relationship where other parts of the world can become rich in the same way. And I can already hear that India, because everybody is India, oh, India, India, India is great, India is wonderful, India is a massive economy, India, there are 400 million people who live in desperate poverty in India, in conditions that we could even imagine. India is so big, I think people oftentimes forget just how big it is. And yes, India has got better. I, mean, I wouldn't make the argument that things haven't changed. Things have changed, right? So one of the things that changed in India is there's no longer famine in the same way it was previously under, under colonial rule, and that's managed better. Uh, there's a political class of uh, Indians who do quite well. Uh, there's some Indian people doing very well, right? That's, that's true. What hasn't changed is that fundamental relationship with the British. <laughs> so a good example of this would be when you call, how oh, about Barclays? When you call Barclays Bank, right? Where does it go through? You talk, you India, right? Go to India. You want somebody to talk about your bank, you can go to India. When you train, saying many, many companies are saying, right? Why? I'm actually you. Why is it? Why do we send root calls from the UK all the way to India and all the way back? Why? Because it's cheaper. Why is it cheaper? Why is it cheaper? Wages are lower, right? We're telling you something, it's telling you the standard of living in India is cheaper, right? And if you actually look at much of the development in India, it's based on the idea that the standard of living is lower, so we'll export our services over there and they can make money off that, right? So that's a very contingent way of developing your economy, because that, what does that mean? That means if the standard of living actually rose to the level in Britain, you stop sending your services, because it wouldn't make any sense. You just get people in Britain to do it, right? So the actual economic of India is based on the fact that it's not quite Africa. Remember, racial hierarchy is in the middle. You can be okay, you can be bad, but you can't really produce, get to the top. It's not possible, because the whole economy is based on being service sector, a cheap service sector. Go on, right? That makes sense. So even though you can look at it and say, well, families are gone, families are gone and maybe things are yeah, no. Are they fundamentally better? Can you solve the problem of the 400 million desperately poor people in India through this way? No, no, it's madness. Stop, stop thinking that you can. And the other thing I would say about this is, even though famines may have disappeared, a child across the world dies every 10 seconds because they have no food. A number of those children are in India. But basically, you just have a famine every day. That's basically what you have. Like, it's the, the, the existence of the 400 million poor people in India is famine. So don't tell me famine is gone and this is better. You just replace it with something different, which is some ways it works, right? But that's the point, right? So what do we need to do then? Um, yeah, what do we need to do? I've been, I've been very negative so far, I think. So, and this black radicalism is a negative tool. Well, <laughs> no, it's negative in that way, but it's positive in other ways. Right, so I have, the argument is already too late. is isn't to say it's already too late to do anything. It's just to say we need to do differently, like revolutionary politics. The reason the book is called Back to Black is because the argument I'm making is that you know, 50 years ago, the world was a very, very different place. The world was on the precipice of an actual revolution. It wasn't 100% certain that the West would survive. It really wasn't. Like, you had communism, you had pan africanism you had uh, movements in Asia, you had the Third World Movement. There was a real moment where people were talking this talk, and it was definitely possible, right? And there are two things which happened. Uh, one of those is violence. Uh, and not violent, and not revolutionary violence, reactionary violence. Right? People, a lot of people were killed, right? Because they were dangerous. You know, this is a huge thing. It's killed lots of people. The second thing that happened was, and this is more important, is soft power. Remember, there's two ways: power, like hard, just to kill people, power, and there's soft power. And this is the more dangerous thing for us: is that, excuse me, we became incorporated. Right? Fifty years ago, there is absolutely no chance I would be standing in front of you as a professor of black studies. That, that would not happen to me. That is, that is impossible. There was no, there were laws, well, 50 years ago, uh, there was no racial nation legislation, right? I could be told you can't have a job because you're black, right? In fact, it's pretty rare, pretty unlikely I'm attending it today, if that's 
But 50 years ago, impossible, right? Uh, but now you have race relation legislation here in the West, in, in America, in, in Europe. You have a growing middle class. You have the illusion that we have been included, right? When I don't make professor, everybody celebrates. Why are you celebrating? I, I, it's good for me, but I don't know what you're going to But we have that idea that because like, you know, we have a black president, it's, it's good for all of us. We can make it, right? Uh, we're kind of dreaming that we are now included, which is simply not true. And in the rest of the world, what happened was you had independence. You had independence, independence right? Independence. Make it independent, I was independent, all these countries are now. It is independent, and that's one of the arguments. Independence is better than not being independent. But are these countries actually independent? And as I gave you the example of chocolate in Ghana, uh, you example of rice in Ghana, you example of uh, India, service, is it really? It's not, none of that's independent. It's entirely dependent on the exploitation of the West, as, as much today as it was ever. There's a reason why, for most of British colonialism, there was no revolutions in these places. The Queen just went down and said, yeah, have your independence. Right? <laughs> yeah, why, not? why not? Because it's not dangerous to us. Right? We can just keep you in the Commonwealth, keep you battering and subservient, and you carry on. In fact, Jamaica, where my family is from, was made independent in 1962. There's no coincidence that it's the same year as the Commonwealth Immigration Act, which did what? It said that if you are from a newly independent country, you have no right to migrate from that country into the United Kingdom. In fact, one of the main reasons we were granted independence was to stop us coming into the country. But remember, before this independence, Britain, Jamaica was part of Britain. Like, it was part of Britain. You couldn't really stop people coming. Because it was one part of the empire to the other part of the empire. So independence is one of the key tools to stop migration. And if you look at what's happened with the Windrush migrants, that's just the logic of that. Ever since 62, every single year, there's been more successive, 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 with more restrictive uh, migration policy from Labour, Conservative, Wooden. And that's followed that logic. Right? So I'm not sure why we're selling, celebrating independence. I thought I said I was going to be positive, so I'm really positive. <laughs> I'm going to make a be positive. I'm the positive, positive signal. So, what's the positive signal? The solution to all this is to rethink. Completely rethink. One of the ways um, to rethink is definitely beyond the nation state. So the nation state is a massive problem. You think you're British, all right? I mean, it's happening in the in the, um, the Windrush scandal, right? Everybody's like, ah, how can how can they treat citizens like this? Do you not understand your historical relationship? I like, really, I don't want to be I don't want to be mean, but we are not citizens. We have never been citizens. We have always been colonial subjects, and we are still treated like colonial subjects. So at least it's a wake-up call to understand our historical relationship to Britain. And what Blair Radigan is based on is saying that the route to our salvation, and the book is really a kind of a, it's theoretical in some ways, but it's actually a practical guide. Look, the route to what we need to do is to see ourselves as a global black nation. It's to forget the nation state. The nation state is completely and utterly imposed upon us. Um, so even so, like my family's from Jamaica, uh, my dad calls Jamaica back home. I'm not sure how he's home. He was taken, his access was taken there in chains. Right? We're not supposed to be there. It's not, it's, not, it's not home in any way, shape, or form. It's a place who were enslaved. Um, I know there's a whole movement to claim black Britishness. I understand it. I guess why you want you, know, you have. I have. My family's massively contributed to, to Britain. Of course, yeah. But my family contributed to a slave plantation. I don't know if I'd say I want to own a slave plantation. Right? And someone else will be able to say, what is the thing you're trying to claim? And Britain is generally just terrible in the world. And it really is historically and current. So, that rather is based on saying that we need to have a radical unity that goes across the nation state. And really says that blackness, blackness itself, and that's why it's called black radicalism, is the revolutionary category. Because what does this do, right? If I say this blackness is, the, is, the, is defined in a, in a political sense, in a political sense, it's not political blackness. That makes sense. Right. In a political sense, it's saying, why do I say black? Why do I claim black? Because, because of the way that slavery happened, particularly because of the West, we were told to hate our African self. We were told to hate the color of our skin, the texture of our hair. We were told to hate it, right? And it's actually by embracing that and what that means, we come up with a different political framework. Because once I say that I'm black and connected to all other black people, then that puts me in the political category of those three million children who die in Southeast Africa every year, right? If I have a national black British framework, I don't get that. I'm just like, well, how do I get that? How do we get black prisoners? How do we stop the police attacking us, etc., etc.? But to really get there, to transform past the nation state, you need a category that does that. And blackness does that. That puts us with the wretched of the earth. There are many of us in this world, like, somewhat like I said, we've been incorporated, but there are many, most of us have not. Most of us have suffered conditions which are, we cannot even consider. And child death is the, is the one which is like the most, the most stark, but it's the biggest reminder. Right? Children die here. 
It's a tragedy for years and years and years. Children's not healthy possible. Well, that's, 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 that child dies every 10 seconds. That's the condition of reality for many of us, right? So to put ourselves in that same category system, that's our project. That's our political project. So if you embrace blackness, you have to embrace the revolutionary project because you can't solve that problem through any other means than abiding with different political and economic systems. How long have we done? 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, so uh, you can't provide, uh, you can't, there's no way to provide a different um, platform. So, quick, yeah, quick detour into Jamaica. I thought I had this time. Quick detour into Jamaica. Jamaica is a perfect example of how the problem of a nation state, and particularly because you do development, this, this is quite an important one. If you think about how developing countries are trying to address their problems, they're stuck in this narrow nationalistic framework. So, Jamaica, for example, is 3 million just over 3 million people, the only thing that's kept Jamaica afloat is the fact that there's more Jamaicans outside Jamaica than in Jamaica. It's literally migration, right? People are migrating to Britain, people are migrating to Canada, America, and because of that, one, there's not so many people on the island, Jamaica's very small, and most of it's uh, bush, you can't really live in most of it, it's hill, bush, crazy. Um, and the other, the other thing that keeps Jamaica afloat in terms of migration is that the single biggest thing in Jamaica's economy is remittances. People spend sending money. So that's pension in Jamaica now, for example. And that is bigger than anything else, bigger than tourism, maybe put together. It's like 60% of GDP. Right? Again, if you look at Jamaica as a neo-colonial space, it's tourism industry. 60% of the money that goes into tourism in Jamaica goes straight. That never even goes into Jamaica. It just goes to some foreign country because they actually own the beaches, own the hotels, own the beaches. And another 20% probably leaks out in general. Uh, so even this big thing in tourism doesn't have any control of it. I uh, think about reggae, Jamaica's main export. Jamaica makes no money in reggae at all, right? There are six, what, six rare companies that control it. I guarantee you not one of them is Jamaica, right? So even the big hit doesn't make any money from it, right? The only, the only thing keeping Jamaica not being the poorest country in the world, like one of the poorest countries in the world, is remittances, which is only because of migration. But what's happened over the last 20 years with migration policy? You can't migrate to Jamaica if you're American anymore. America don't want you. Canada don't want you. Britain, we certainly don't want you. Like, that, that door's closed, I know. So what's going to happen to Jamaica over the next uh, 50 years? Population's going to go up, and the money's going to go down. I ain't sending Jamaica, I ain't sending, why am I sending, after my dad uh, passes away, why am I sending any money to Jamaica? I, I, I don't know anybody there, right? And so, this is a huge problem for Jamaica's economy. And many countries are in the same basic position, because they rely on remittances in the same way, and migration is very difficult now. So what's the solution? Now, in the Jamaican national narrow framework of nationalism solution, it is brand Jamaica. Let's support brand Jamaica. We can make money apparently off brand Jamaica. Get more tourists. Where does the tourist money go? Don't go to Jamaica. Go somewhere else. Right? Um, the, other, the other plan, and this at least is at least a plan which is uh, transnational, is to get me to feel like I'm Jamaican. So people like me whose parents from Jamaica, I can vote in Jamaica. I probably have more rights in Jamaica than in the actual Jamaican. Right? No, I'm, I'm uh, because they want, they say that they understand that, at least on that level, you need people like me to feel Jamaican, national pride, they want to invest, support, etc. I'm a test of dead end. 100% that is dead end. What did I just say is happening in Britain? That British. You know what I know about Jamaica? Jamaica, that's bad. That's the best. I don't know, right? It's nice to visit maybe, um, have a plantation wedding. You know, have a wedding with us, slave members. Anyway, that's a side <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, yeah, so that's one of the policies. And then the other policy, where did Jamaica just go back to for money? Anybody guess where Jamaica just went back to for some money? Making some money, because Jamaica was in money. Where do you think it went? The IMF? Yes, the IMF, which was like the worst thing that ever happened to Jamaica in the first place, and now they're going back to the IMF, right? Get some more money, and you actually have commentators in Jamaica who were saying, oh, we're spending too much money on social welfare reforms, we should cut that, and you know, try and make some, uh, some industry which only Jamaica can produce, and Um, and Jamaica barely has a social safety net anyway. That is, that's one of the lowest spending on social safety, on social security um, in the world. But those are the largest because you've got because they only see Jamaica. They can't see even a pan Caribbean uh, idea. It's all about Jamaica, 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 national, national, national. Now, Jamaica is also interesting because one of Jamaica's national heroes, and you should often listen to your heroes, is somebody called Marcus Garvey. Anybody know what Marcus Garvey's solution was to Jamaica's problem? Go back to Africa. Go back to Africa. Garvey was just buying boats to take people off the island and leave and go back to Africa. Because Garvey knew 100 years ago that 
This is not gonna work. Like, you know this is not this is not the case that you know what I mean? Therefore, this makes no sense. A, we're not supposed to be here. Remember, it's like, this is an island that's not supposed to have three million people on it. It's certainly not supposed to have six million people on it as the population gets in the future. Uh, this is a bill for us. I mean, Jamaica, how you can have Jamaica national, as I said before, Jamaica was part of the British Empire until 1962. Only given independence to stop Jamaicans migrating from Jamaica to Britain. How is this a national, how is this a national identity that I should feel proud of? Really, I mean, I don't really don't think. That's a creation of the West. Um, so Garvey was still, Garvey knew. Garvey toured around new, saw Latin America, married, same thing. So look, black people, we're not, this is, this is a war. This is, this is not going to work. We need to go re redeem Africa. That's the African revolution, which is really at the heart of uh, black, black radicalism. So that's really the solution here, right? But oftentimes what we get focused on is fixing the symptoms of our problem. A uh, symptom would be unemployment, uh, police brutality, um, even child mortality. It's a symptom, right? It's, it's produced by something. But what's it produced by? It's produced by the disease. And the disease is the waste, racism, capital, whatever you want to call it, right? The disease is racism. But you can't solve that within this system. You have to change it, right? And so, Garveyism is, is, is good in some ways, guys, <coughs> bad other It's good because it gets that basic idea, right? This is another one. It's good in the sense that Africa for the African you, you need to. The utopia, if you like, of, of the black revolution is the African Revolution. Africa is, as I said before, the richest continent on the planet, has the resources, not, no probably no other place in the world could do this, to, if you had a planned economy in Africa, you could actually take Africa out of the world economically. Because Africa has everything you need. You can trade with each other, you can have everything. You say, yeah, buy it, see, we're not, we're not buying. It's actually, it's, it's actually possible. The only place is probably possible. Right? So you're thinking about utopia, where's the end point of that? And that sounds all crazy, but 50 years ago, this was a proper discussion. People were having these discussions um, in independence. You know, should we have that national, uh, nationalized economy? Should we go to the United States of Africa? Should we kick out the Western, Western companies, et cetera, et cetera? Those are real conversations. And 50 years is not that long ago. You will most likely will be here in 50 years' time. So the point I'm saying is if we change our framework and change the way we are doing things, in another 50 years, we could, back, we could be back on the precipice. Revolution. It's only because we've gone down this other route where we've become comfortable, we've become, a, we've become resigned to the fact that this is the only way that we can be. Uh, we've got stuck in this national, this national identity, but we haven't really thought about this. this what's, what's happening? We can do something else, right? So, the mechanism for this, and I was teaching this, I teach this on Black Stuff today, this morning, and the students are like, well, that sounds good, but you know, it's a bit utopian, it's not going to work, is it? Don't be silly. Let's just, you know, let's just go. Let's actually have the conversation. <laughs> I'll pick it up next week. But um, the mechanism is clear, right? There's even blue. This is what I think we have to understand in our history. There are blueprints for this. So, as I mentioned, the Guardian movement. The Guardian movement was 5 million people across 50 countries 100 years ago. Given the population of the world, that's probably more like 20 million people today, right? There's a lot of people. How did so, an organization build? That's the biggest black organization that ever possibly existed. If they can do that then, with no smartphones, no Twitter, no none of that stuff, how can we not do that then? The mechanisms are there, they're easily there, more easily there than they were before. So what we've said is, let's, we've said, let's, let's start, let's do it, let's do it, let's start it. So we started the Ram League Organization of Black Unity, it's based on Malcolm X's organization of Pro-American Unity, which is essentially garbage with radical politics. And we said, let's do it, let's start it, let's start it, let's start it, let's put that back into practice, because this is where, this is where we can go. If you want to check out the organizations, uh, blackunity.org.uk and one of the first projects is about political education because we need political education because you don't get any of this stuff in schools, right? The stuff which I teach about now, write about now, none of it was in schools. Absolutely every single part of it was from community education, family, library, etc. Et right? So we can't teach ourselves other stuff. So while you are over here poisoning your mind, with um, <laughs> kind of <the> <laughs> there's a whole range of other literature you can be reading and get involved with and doing, right? The degree is important, but the education you can get outside of it is far, 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 far more. Um, so yeah, we, want, we, we have a crowd from the go going for the Marcus Club Education Centre where we want to do start kind of putting some of this stuff into practice. As a time is finished, I'm going to finish this and just but just remind people that look, revolution is possible. It's always been possible, and the only thing that really stops us from is that you have to remind us that we actually have the power, right? Slavery colonialism, neocolonialism, that was our mechanisms for taking our power away, right? And that's how that what the West is built upon. All we have to do is reframe, rethink, re, re move in a different manner, and we can take that power back and have a completely different world. So 
So revolution is possible. Uh, and don't give up in the struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the talk, and uh, just a reminder that the book is available um, if you want to read more uh, for £15 on a discounted price, um, so please um, uh, take advantage of that, and uh, you can also uh, maybe get it signed um, uh, at S um, SRC afterwards. Um, now we'll hear about, you know, five, ten minute uh, response from Tribune. Uh, can, anyone, can anyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so firstly, yeah, thank you very much, Kende. I thought that was a brilliant talk. Um, and I think your arguments around colonialism and, and um, the horrors of colonialism, what they represent, um, is very sophisticated. And I think particularly uh, its centrality to capitalism and to the global capitalist order and indeed to the, to the development of capitalism uh, over the last um, several centuries. Um, I think... What's, what's really important in, in what you've uh, highlighted is, A, I, I wholly agree with you that revolution is possible. Uh, so let that be the takeaway of today, if anything. Um, but I think you also made a really good point in terms of the limits of social democracy. Um, and you kind of tackled the kind of reform versus revolution uh, debate. I did an economics degree, uh, which included a module in development. We do still study Rosto. Um, <laughs> it is ridiculous. Um, and I think, I think what you mentioned about neocolonialism is absolutely right. And, and it is the way the global power structures still operate today. And we see it in terms of our so-called free trade and other relations with Africa, uh, policies like the EU's um, um, CAP, etc. And in fact, there have been recent developments in terms of British aid. Uh, where they've unashamedly uh, been moving towards a direction of saying that we don't only we, we shouldn't be giving aid to African countries. Uh, our aid money should be going to British companies and African countries. Um, so you know, just laying that out very nakedly. And I think what you what you mentioned about the comfortability that we have in Western societies, I think that is a product, particularly of uh, neoliberalism. Uh, in the last 30 years where we, we have been, uh, you know, during the boom cycles of capitalism, been made to feel like we can share in, in those spoils. And just one other thing is that I, I grew up in, uh, in Kenya, and uh, when we talk about the limits of education here and, and what we're taught here and what's missing from our education here, I can tell you it's very much the same in Kenya. Um, I grew up in Kenya, and the only part of Kenyan history that I learned was how... Uh, the British colonialists were so great in building railways for us and, uh, you Thank know, you. those lovely people. <laughs> and we were told to be sad for those who got eaten by lions. But <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> but I think if I can pose a couple of points and a couple of questions to you. And you, you talked about um, Cadbury and, and uh, chocolate and, and, you know, the, the exploitation there, which I think is a good... Uh, representative of, of how capitalism continues to ex exploit uh, Africa uh, and the global south. But I think what, what, one thing I'd want to pose to you is that capitalism is as dependent on the exploitation of labor mm -hmm. here in Britain for the production of the raw materials um, that it steals from, from African nations. Um, and so where, where do these workers fit in to the idea of, of this black revolution, um, what, what role can they play in that? Um, I also think that you mentioned uh, independence, and I think you slightly discounted the role of independence movements, uh, the rebellions that, that took place, and the vast sacrifices that people made in fighting against the British Empire, which ultimately made it too expensive for Britain, if not anything else, to maintain uh, colonialism, and they understood that they needed to shift the narrative and, uh, and frame it in a different way. Um, of course, it's still ongoing, but as you mentioned. But yeah, so I think, I think that's, that's one thing. And I think uh, you mentioned about the nation state, and I, I completely agree with you. I'm someone who 
who believes that all borders should be torn down, they, they are a product of uh, capitalism and a means of division of working people and, and people in general. But what, what I wanted to ask is that how, in, in, in an in a ideal scenario where there is this black radical movement that crosses borders, uh, which is united to some degree, um, how does that confront capitalism? Like, how does this movement across different nation states dismantle capitalism within their countries and outside of their countries? Um, if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And the last <coughs> thing is that I think um, you mentioned about Marcus Garvey, and obviously he was a, um, a great intellectual who had some brilliant ideas. But and also, as you mentioned, had you know, one of the biggest movements uh, in history. But I think towards the end of his life and, and um, in terms of the trajectory of the movement that he founded, we, you see that there was a, a real lack of appeal for the movement um, as it progressed in the, in the United States, which resulted in Marcus Garvey, for example, resorting to meeting with the KKK um, to, to try and work out mutually beneficial uh, policies with white supremacists, which in my mind is extremely reactionary. Mm -hmm. So just uh, to understand how you, you square that circle and where that comes in. Um, but yeah, so I don't have much to add other than that, but just to say that, yeah, revolution is entirely possible, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions. They're good questions. Um, so there's a whole chapter in the, in the book on black Marxism because, you know, black people have been absolutely at the forefront of Marxist struggles for a very, very long time. People like Claudia Jones, uh, George Padmore, you can just go through a list, a list always because Marxism has always offered this promise of revolution, etc., etc. But most black people who have joined the Communist Party have eventually left the Communist Party, like really, because they realize that there's... It's such a Eurocentric notion. Marxism is, still has Eurocentrism at its core. So Cedric Robinson, who actually writes the book Black Marxism, and he would call himself a Marxist, critiques Marx and says what well, Marx imagined the European proletariat, was industrial worker, was the savior of history, and then built a theory around it. Right? And, this is not, and this is not really true. Right? So the, actually, the way, if you look at how Marxist revolutions have happened, it's like nothing the way that Marx said they would happen. Right? It's been the peasantry. It hasn't been in Europe. It's been in it's been in China, it's been in African countries, it's been in uh, the Caribbean. It's been completely opposite to what Marx has said, right? In a sense, because, and why is that? Because these workers in the West you're talking about have always been, and we're part of that now, have always been protected from the worst oppression. Always. How does Marx come up with the theory of oppression at a time of slavery? It doesn't really account slaves as the, the most oppressed, right? It talks about, you know, the working classes are the oppressed, da, 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 da. because the workers in the West have always been protected in that sense. Even when their conditions were terrible, they weren't slavery. And that Cabbage example is a perfect example, right? We treat our workers in Birmingham okay, but we won't treat our workers in, in Africa okay at all, right? And so there is this, this idea that we are the 99% that you get from Occupy, which is really a Marxist idea, you know, there's the 1% of owners and everybody else. I mean, that's not, come on, that's nonsense. I mean, look at the amount of money you earn. If you earn the average salary in Britain, you're in something like the top 95% of earners in the entire world. How does that put you in the same position as somebody who's struggling to eat? It just doesn't, right? I mean, in a very real way, and that's why social democracy is so appealing, because what is social democracy talking about? It's talking about how do we share out these spoils better, right? That's really what I'm saying. More tax, aid, tax the rich. That just means tax the spoils of imperialism and give it to the workers in the West. So I'm not saying it's impossible <laughs> that the workers in the West can join in that revolution. I'm just saying I've never seen any evidence of that happening. And so Franz Fanon talked about waking, waiting for Sleeping Beauty to wake up. And as by that, he meant the industrial workers. I just say, you ain't got time for that. You just need to do, we need to do what we need to do, and maybe they come along. Um, independent, no, I know, definitely. In British Empire, there were definitely independent struggles. But also, in many places, they weren't really that big independent. There was kind of like this handover of power. Um, and even when there were independent struggles, it was still the same. They still worked out a way to keep the same basic relationship. Um, in fact, that we're all in the Commonwealth. Like, we're all in the Commonwealth. And the fact that we're all still in the Commonwealth tells you something as well, right? Uh, so it's not to play down the independence struggles. Independence is important, certainly. Um, but I just argue that none of these countries are actually really independent and didn't get what they were really fighting for and instead got bought off with nationhood, country, 
motorcade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how does it come from capitalism? So if you have, if you have this, if the black revolution happens and you have nationalized resources in Africa, that's the end of, that's the end of capitalism. Literally, capitalism depends on the fact that you can exploit resources from Africa. Literally depends on it. Like, if you can't do that anymore, the whole economic, it, it falls apart, it falls apart. In the same way, it depends on the cheap labor that you have in Asia, right, to produce stuff. So if that ends, then again, you can't have capitalism. So that's how, it, you can't have a prosperous, unified Africa and have capitalism. The two things just don't go together. That's why Africa is so poor. Um, and yeah, Garveyism didn't die because of lack of appeal. Uh, Garveyism died because, because the biggest problem in black movements, and actually Garvey even talks about itself, the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. We have these Messiah figures. And Garvey, this is the thing about Garvey, I say Garveyism, I don't really talk about Marcus Garvey particularly. Um, people like Amy Jakes Garvey. Amy Jakes Garvey is probably more important than Marcus Garvey, particularly in how we remember the Garvey movement. It's Amy Jakes who writes all the stuff. You've got five million members, this huge movement, right? But he still becomes too dependent on his figurehead of Garvey. And when they arrest him and they, they, they challenge him for um, mail fraud, and stuff, and it, just, it just ends. Like, the whole thing is still there, but it's because he had that black messiah figure, it still just kind of disappears. Same with Malcolm's organization of Afro-American unity that nobody knows about. Because once he dies, he disappears. This is why you have to build an organization and not build it around a person. And, um, and yeah, certainly Garveyism was reactionary in many ways. Like that, that, I would never say Garveyism is particularly radical in his politics. I think the mechanism of the, that global black nation, that's the mechanism. And then what Malcolm X essentially picks that up and makes it radical, gives it a different analysis with the OAU. Anyway, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we will now open to questions. We'll take about three at a time. So if you would like to pose a question to either of the speakers, please raise your hand high and we'll um, wait for the microphone. So uh, we'll start over here. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that I think you agree with Garvey's idea that the solution is to move back to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, how does that take into account the fact that there are very now strong different cultural identities, how does that take into account, um, will Africans be welcoming to, I don't know, how many millions of Caribbeans and black Americans go into Africa, and won't there be clashes? Thank you. There's right behind you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned neocolonialism, and there was no mention of neocolonialism within, say, developing countries at the moment. So you look at, like, say, the, the Turkish state or, like, the Indian state, for oh, example. Yeah, oh, Let's just yeah. take the Indian state. <laughs> just wanted to get your opinion on that because, I mean, we, we, there is a revolution, I suppose, required, but there's also a revolution required internally within or, um, col col previously colonized states, mm -hmm. basically because of the... The, c the colonial ways in which they're still colonizing their own people, the political elite that got transfer of power from the British Empire to now ruling the, uh, the states in, say, in Asia or, or, or maybe even in Africa. Uh, so just maybe some uh, comments on that and how potentially um, the people of color could then like, you know, link up together to, to, to maybe you know, fight this, this, uh, this fight together against capitalism. Thank you, and we'll take a um, gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kendi. I can't wait to read your book. Um, just touching on your solution, so the sort of Garveyite solution, um, and you spoke about how, you know, 50 years ago there were talks about the United States um, of, um, of Africa, sorry. Um, I wanted to just, you know, get your view on the fact that, you know, people often talk about that, and, you know, Kwame Nkrumah. So if we're taking Ghana, for example, but what? But what people often forget is for every Nkrumah you had a J.B. Dankwa or, or maybe, a, you know, a Kofi Buzia. Mm. So you had a black conservative. And I think there's often, you know, an assumption that somehow, you know, Africa wants what you're talking about. I mean, if we actually think about it, you know, there's a strong case to make that, you know, black conservatism at the moment, <coughs> you know, is a stronger political case in Africa. Mm. So I want to know how your grassroots solution can, if you want, fight that black elite, that black business, that, you know, if you want black political class? Mm -hmm. right. Do you want one more question? Or are you I'll go and take another yeah, one. Okay, we'll take uh, one more. Yeah, right here. <laughs> so I really enjoyed your talk on all of this. Um, I'm just wondering if you can touch upon the dangers of um, 
maybe like black nationalism and, and just like not seeing the intersectional identities of and not depending solely on race, but also maybe how like masculinity can play into nationalist movements, especially black nationalist movements, um, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera. Yeah. And if you can maybe give your thoughts on that. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, so first question was uh, back to Africa. So I'm not saying that we should go back to Africa today. In fact, that's one of the problems with the Gavi movement, right? As he jumps to this kind of the long-term solution too quickly. There's no like solution just let's get some boats and go to Africa, right? You have to have a movement, and the movement is just as important in Africa as it is here, right? Uh, that global black nation thing, that political education, that's, like you said, the education in Africa is probably worse in many ways than it is here, right? So there needs to be, a, that, that has to happen first so that we understand, not, and it's not just about education, it's also about the conditions, right? I mean, Africa is currently the poorest continent in the world. You can't take millions of people and put millions of people in Africa. It'd be terrible, I'd be disaster, that'd be absolute disaster. So this is part of a process of building, of, you know, once you, once you change the conditions and you're creating work, the truth about Africa is it's the only part of the world which is underpopulated because of slavery, because of um, colonialism, because of the conditions. Actually, there's not enough people. If you did have this development in Africa, you'd actually need people. This wouldn't even be that crazy an idea. It'd be like, you need people, people in the Caribbean need jobs, why not come to Africa, right? So it's about making those conditions. Definitely not just, just jumping on and just going straight away. Um, yeah, neocolonialism, I mean, like, one of the, the key way that neocolonialism is done nowadays is through the elite, right? So the elite are put into these positions, they act in the same, in maybe in worse ways in many ways, um, and yeah, they're the problem. The elite are the problem. The elite are just generally the problem, right? In many, in many ways, the elite are the problem. And so you have to deal with that colonial elite because they are in the way, yeah? They're properly in the way. And when I was, I was in Nigeria earlier this year, and I was talking about this, and I was like, oh, well, but what about the elite? They'll just kill you. They don't care. They don't mind. They'll, they'll, they'll just kill you. They, the, the political freedom doesn't exist. Um, so you do have to work a way around that, right? Also, though, I'd say countries like Turkey, India as well, China. Remember that hierarchy? Black, blacks at the bottom, whites at the top, and there's this, this is middle ground. And what you've seen in, in many countries in the middle ground is they've kind of embraced anti-blackness. And they use anti-blackness to promote their, their own agenda. China is a perfect example. I mean, China is terrible in Africa. I mean, China... It's difficult to say it would end up worse than Europe because Europe is so bad. Um, but, but China may actually, like, China may settle, settle a colonialism in Africa. But it's, that's a possibility. You don't know, right? Which is why that's one of the problems of the third world movement and the people of color thing is, in the same way I, I don't really trust the, the, the white working class to, to wake up, I'm not 100% sure I trust Chinese to do, to do the right thing. If it, I think that's why you need independence of Africa, to have some power so you can say, well, actually, let's, let's have this conversation on a level. Because there are, look, people in China suffer racism, same, same route that people in Africa suffer racism. Uh, but I think that independence is really important because there are ways that this doesn't end up well for Africa and black people more generally. Um, I'd say black conservatism is stronger with the elite. I don't know if it's stronger with the people. I don't know the man, when we talk about Africans, we're often talking about the elite, right? Who can afford to come over to Europe? Who's got the platforms? It tends to be the elite. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, it, I think it's because it is... Certainly things like churches, if you think why so many people have embraced the church in the, in the masses, because it's like, what else do you do, right? Like, it's just terrible, so we're just going to go to the church. Um, I think one of the other things that's happened, which, which I, I think makes the argument for black radicalism, is uh, the spread of extreme Islam, right? Why are people joining Boko Haram? Why are they joining Al-Shabaab? It's not because they really support... Uh, Muslim extremism, right? It's because they understand, they get it, they know why their countries are poor, they know why they're poor, they know the West is the problem, and the only people fighting back against the West, want it in the West, who is it? It's the extremist Muslims, right? And it's not something I agree with, but I can see why people would be attracted to that, because what else are you going to do? A, you should watch the um, documentary, um, oh, what's it called? Robert Beckford made it about Ghana. Ah, oh, I totally forgot the name of it. There's a, it'll come back to me. There's a documentary, Robert Beckford, a professor of theology, went to Ghana and he's talking about chocolate and rice production. And he's in this place, Birima, um, in, in Ghana. They used to have booming rice production. Short story, because of the IMF basically destroyed it, flooded the market with American rice. Now there's no rice production in Ghana almost. And everybody's poor. Their daughters are running off to the village to go and, to go and try and make some money, talk to the town to go and make some money. And he's, just, he's talking to this guy and he has a picture of Osama bin Laden on his phone. He's like, why, why? He's not even a Muslim. He's like, why have you got him on his phone? And his, his actual answer is, he's the only person fighting against the West, right? 
So because you have this vacuum where there are no real radical, these people would have been in radical movement. They would have been in the Pan-African movement. They'd have been, let's have revolution. Because that's gone, they're stuck with, they're stuck with, um, with terrorism, right? Which, so actually, if you want to end that problem, just have some radicalism. Let's give some people actual alternatives. I think the grassroots get it. They just don't have a funnel for it. Because um, they understand, I think they understand better than I understand them anyways. Um, and black nationalism, oh certainly, yeah. That's just a, a big chunk of the book is about that problem. Uh, black nationalism has been way too restricted, way too masculine, way too, I mean, in many versions of black nationalism, it's just this kind of, very, a, a more extreme version of European patriarchy, right? Huge, has been hugely adopted. So one of the things I do in the book is to say, well, let's take that out of the black radical tradition. And let's say what black radicalism is based on, the unity of all people of African descent. And all people means all people. Like, you just can't be putting in barriers to this because they don't make any sense, right? Particularly women, uh, particularly uh, if you're LGBT, like, it's all people, right? The, the theory of this is very, very clear. So unfortunately, the practice of that has not been the case. In many ways, you can see there's lots of problems with misogyny, et cetera, et cetera. But also, I think we need to look back at this history differently. Because if you actually look back at this history, while there have been these figures uh, who have been hugely problematic, there have also been like women are massive. Like, we don't think women were part of the Garvey movement. Like I said, Amy Jakes Garvey is probably more important than Marcus Garvey. Uh, the Black Panther Party was 60% female. 60% female. Like, it's hugely. So we've kind of, we kind of have this patriarchal lens of looking back as well. When we look back and find the men and go, oh, yeah, look at those male movements. And actually, the history of this is not true, right? You couldn't have any of these movements without history, without women. And one of the things that really gets me is when people start to say like nationalism and violence, these are, these are male things. One of my favorite, when it's, I was asked recently, who would I want to meet if have anybody in history? And it actually wasn't Malcolm X, right? I feel, I feel like I know Malcolm, I don't need to meet Malcolm. There's <laughs> <laughs> um, Nanny, Nanny of the Maroons, Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Maybe for me, I'd just love to talk to her, she'd be fascinating, because you don't, you she didn't really write anything, so you don't really know. But in terms of leading the Maroon Rebellion, in Jamaica, she's hugely important. Warrior, f could take down a whole battalion of British of six, with six people, six Maroons. Um, her brother sold out, actually sold out to the British, and she stayed firm, said, no, we're gonna be independent, we're not gonna sell out, we're gonna do I mean, that. You have sh this, women who are massively important in the black radical tradition, usually, and we need to look, go back and pick out and reclaim those stories, because they're there, we just don't look for them. still slightly skirted the issue of African ruling classes um, because I think I think this is a problem ultimately if you are talking about a united movement that can confront global capitalism mm -hmm. you do have to very necessarily get over that problem of the ruling classes of these African countries which are subservient to Western countries and part of, of the, the capitalist system and I think Relating slightly to what you said about uh, Marxism being Eurocentric earlier, and I mean, you probably know more about Marxism than me, but I mean, I, as far as I understand it, Marxism was never the idea that European working classes must rise up against their countries first and then maybe show some leniency to other countries, but it was very much about workers of all countries and in any country um, opposing um, capitalism through the labor power that they have, which is a central feature of, mm -hmm. of capitalism, um, and that necessarily revolution would have to be global, and that the, the downside of revolution starting in a country not at the top of the power structures mm -hmm. of global capitalism is that they will be defeated by the global mm -hmm. power structure, as we've seen in numerous countries, uh, including in Russia years ago and, and the ones you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think when we look at the working class here in Britain today, I think it, it has obviously vastly transformed in the last hundred years. And, and the picture of the working class here in the UK today is a diverse working class. It isn't just white people. It is very yeah. much most ethnic minorities <laughs> really in well, yeah. are working class. And, and I think that... I don't know, in my opinion, and, and I, I want you to come back to this if, if you can, but I think that we have a role to play as a working class in this country to undermine our country's capitalism such that in Africa and other places they can do the same without facing the, the reactionary backlash. I think one, just one final anecdote is, I remember this during the so-called Arab Spring, mm -hmm. and I was speaking to a friend of mine who was uh, involved in, in the Bahraini revolution, and I said, you, know, you have 
such a huge percentage of your population coming out on the streets, not working, striking, resisting. Why is this not working? Um, and she told me very simply, she said, in, in our country, when we revolt, we're not just revolting against our country. Mm. We're revolting against the Gulf powers. We're revolting against the Western powers who are very much crushing us at the moment. And that's what I, I, I think that <coughs> plays a role somehow. Yeah. I say, so it's... <laughs> It's a nice idea, but like I said, the practice of Marxism is just not there. Like, it really isn't there. Like, it, look at the Communist Party. The Communist International couldn't care less about any other part of Europe. It was a really Eurocentric thing. Uh, Lenin tried to make the Communist International broader, and nobody was interested. Like, there's a reason why people joined the left, because actually it was more about this European project. And actually, one of the things that's happened with true proletariat work, well, I don't really hear it. It's not really here anymore. That's kind of been exported out in the different parts of the world. And so I just think the conditions are so much different. And I include us in that. So us in the working class here, are we now in the same boat as people across the world? Were we ever? And when Marx, at the end of the Communist Manifesto, writes, workers of the world unite, I actually don't think he was including the enslaved. I really don't. Like, if you read the book, it don't sound like he is. Right? And there's people in slavery at the time. It is a very European idea, right? Um, and the thing about it, African, let me be clear about the African ruling class. They just need to go. That is the solution. No, there's no other solution to this. They just need to go, right? They're the problem. And once you have this, organ if you had, imagine the mechanism for that, the global organization that has people across Africa, so millions of people in Africa in this organization, then you get rid of them, you move on. You just, you just, they, the they are counter-revolutionary forces that need to be moved politely. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take uh, more questions. So if you'd like to pose a question, please just raise your hand and we'll pass the mic. <laughs> okay, um, going back to this idea of the like black radical revolution also in African states, isn't there a bit of a danger, and I, I'm sure you've probably like spoken or thought about this and maybe you could explain, of assimilating the experience of Africans and of black people in other countries? through the platform, which I feel like could be an easy trap to fall into. And even here when we're, you know, sort of comparing um, the kind of oppression that occurs through the elites within African countries and also the oppression that um, is visible in the West, I feel like there's a, how do we make sure to, yeah, how do we work against not falling into a space that isn't nuanced and also creating an identity that often happens that is completely shared or assimilated in a way that might not be true. Thank you. There's a question. Ma'am, you had a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're saying that... So I've got my head stuck. I remember reading in Staying Power that after the Napoleonic Wars, there was a village in Yorkshire somewhere where the whole of the village signed a petition saying do not re-enslave people because mm -hmm. that was the rumour that was going round. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a working-class village who may never have seen an African person mm -hmm. but understood the issues and were prepared to stand up and say, we think it's wrong and we don't want to be part of it. So mm -hmm. surely there are opportunities for people who maybe have never met each other to understand each other's issues and to know that if something's wrong, it's irrelevant whether it's happening to you or not, it's wrong and you support people in objecting to it. <coughs> Thank you. There's a gentleman down here in the green Hi. Uh, thanks very much for both the both speakers as well. And Kenya, it was an amazing talk that you gave. Um, just a quick question about Libya um, and Sub-Saharan Africa and kind of the northern part of Africa. Um, if you'd comment on you know, his removal, uh, was it about Pan-Africanism? And was it about perhaps the use of you know, um, getting away from the petrodollar? Mm -hmm. Any other question? And then um, all the way in the back. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we read Rosto here to critique him, by the way, not because he's <laughs> a great policy guy. <laughs> but I'd like to uh, push you even more on uh, the Marxism stuff. In that, yeah, the, uh, <coughs> the early 20th century European Communist parties were terrible on race and colonialism. Yeah. 
But as you said, there's been some fantastic uh, black Marxists and uh, movements to try and decolonize Marxism, yeah. CLR James, uh, dependency theory, world system theory, yeah. Kevin Anderson recently going back to Marx, saying actually Marx was writing about India slavery, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so do you think it's kind of both analytically and politically valid to be using Marx in a kind of um, non-neocolonialist way, or would you just say we're going to check out Marxism? Thank you. <laughs> we'll take one, one two more. Yeah. Um, in the back, yeah. Uh, yeah. First of all, I want to say uh, I enjoyed your talk thoroughly. Um, on the point on Garveyism, um, from someone like myself who's lived like in different part of Africa, what do you see as like the first step for the lower class or like your everyday people to like make change for themselves to start this revolution that we're talking about because in countries like Zimbabwe, Gambia uh, and like many others where like rulers refuse to leave it's kind of hard to start a revolution when the rulers are in in power and the locals don't know much or can't do much about it. Thank you. Thank you and is there any <laughs> Sorry, I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask a question about what would you say to those who will reply to development in, in regards to developing Africa? The only way to do so is with European um, influence. Uh, mm -hmm. It has very neo-colonial roots, I think, but the idea that African people never were even given the resources or the tools or the infrastructure to um, create politically or socially val like uh, sort, of, sort of valid governments. Uh, and so how can we really develop Africa without having an idea of what development means? And I think it's rooted in European colonialism. Um, so for example, a writer, Ethiopian German writer, um, uh, his name is, I believe, Aswa Wosin Aseret, uh, wrote about the need to cooperate with European countries in order to move forward in Africa. So I'd like your response to that. Thank you. Would you like to... Um, yeah, I, mean, I guess the first question about assimilating experiences, the whole point is to say, look, that you have made the different ex the experiences are vast and they are different, but they are produced by the same thing. That's the key thing, right? Like, so there's... Oftentimes in literature, tends to be literature, or even someone like um, Stuart Hall or um, Fanon, or there's always someone who's like, when I, I realized I was black when I came to Europe, right? Before we were all black, so it didn't, wasn't really a thing, right? I guarantee you, you were still black when you were in Martinique or when you were in Ghana, and the same thing which is structured in my life here is the same thing structured in your life there. There is a reason why skin bleaching is actually more prevalent in majority black countries than it is in the diaspora, because blackness, whiteness frames the whole thing. Right, explains your existence. So even if you don't realize it, that not mean it's not impacting on you, right? And the same root cause of why you have these experiences in, in Ghana are the same root cause of why we have the experiences here. That's a central point of the argument. That's not to say the experiences are the same, but the cause is the same. And because the cause is the same, then we should unify around an identity. Now importantly, this identity is solely that it's a political identity. It's to say that we're part of a shared nation, we're part of a shared political and economic unity, right? Now, Europeans have no problem with saying it, right? This is, this is the basis of the West, right? France don't like England, England don't like France, America's different. There's loads of differences. But on the basic premise of the political economy, everybody agrees, right? There's a shared set of frameworks about how things are agreed. So there's no, there's no, there's no reason why you can't have a unity across um, this fundamental belief about how we organize, what the economy should look like, and still have massive variety of differences. Because it's solely a political, what we call a political essentialism. It's not about culture, et cetera. Um, yeah, look, there's a difference between the working class supporting things and the working class being involved in a revolution. Like, it's easy to say, let's not have slavery. Like, you can have anti-slavery movements, right? Like, people do that all the time. I'm not saying that the working class hasn't been an ally in some ways. I'm just saying I haven't seen any evidence that they want to have true revolutionary politics, which would, and remember, in my, in my, what I'm saying is that even the working classes and even us in the working classes here derive some benefit from being here. My children are not at risk of dying because they can't eat. That is not a risk they ever are going to experience as long as I'm here. However, if I was in, if I was in somewhere else, the Congo, it would be actual risk. So there are certain things that we benefit from 
right? From being here, all of us, every one of us. I haven't seen any evidence that, actually I haven't seen any evidence that the black working class here want to do this, by the way. It's not just a white, it's basically about all of us here. I haven't seen any evidence that us here are really interested in changing that, that dynamic. But I could be wrong. Again, I, I would like to be wrong. I'm just not going to put together a political idea that relies on it because it's probably a bad idea. Um, Libya, I mean, I don't really think the West needs that many any excuses to get rid of Gaddafi. I mean, they didn't really, don't really like Gaddafi. Gaddafi was a problem uh, for many reasons. Um, was it about the picture? Pot potentially, potentially. I mean, certainly. One thing I say is that Gaddafi's influence over Pan-Africanism is overplayed, I think, actually. Um, if you look at, you know, Gaddafi is hugely important in the African Union, and the African Union is terrible. I mean, the African Union is appalling. Like, it's, that is basically a mechanism of neocolonialism. Um, so there's not that much evidence that he was that committed to this kind of revolutionary pan-Africanism at all, but it's certainly possible that he's, in his changing economics, that was one of the reasons why they wanted to get rid of him, certainly, certainly, yeah. I mean, North Africa's interest in, for lots of reasons, one of the reasons North Africa's interest in is uh, because part of the way we do is descend to Europe a lot of the time in how we think about things, right? So Africa, the, Africa for the Africans is first used in the seventh century by Dahir al-Kahini in Tunisia, who's actually against Arab invasion, right? So the, North Africa looks like that because of the Arab invasion into into Africa in the about, in about, around about seventh century. Uh, even the slave trade. I mean, the Europeans didn't just get, didn't just make up the idea of a slave trade. Slave trade existed beforehand. So when Columbus comes back from uh, the Americas first, he brings a gift to the Spanish queen, and this is a gift of people he's enslaved. And where is he going to sell these slaves on this? Arab slave trade markets, right? The slave trade existed. In fact, you want to explain why slavery happens. That's one of the main reasons. It's not just this European crazy idea. There's also these other factors which Europe isn't always the center. That goes back to this Marxist critique where I'm, I'm not against it. Actually, I sounded quite like I was against Marxism. I really not, actually. Marxism and Marxism, and not just Marx, Marxism, like dependency theory, well, it would sound very similar to a lot of the stuff of the analysis which I gave you about society, right? There's some very, very, very good analysis but in Marxism and some very, very good ideas in there. And I quote Marx quite a lot, actually. Um, but I think fundamentally, it's still a Eurocentric idea. It really is. And I don't, I don't know to what extent you can descend. I don't know to what extent. I think the fact that it's Marxism, I I, I'm just, that's the best way it is. But so in black Marxism, Cedric Robinson makes the argument that you know Marx was basically right but he got the subject wrong. So actually, where are you going to find revolution? And he's right in this, this is where revolutions actually happen is in the third world where you actually have those really conditions, the real conditions of the proletariat exist there, they don't exist here. So he's basically saying, look, so therefore we should rethink about Marx as really a third world movement, et cetera, et cetera, and actually put a lot of this other stuff that we wouldn't typically think of Marxism into Marxism, so the Haitian Revolution, for example. But why would you do that? The Haitian Revolution happened before Marx we wrote anything, right? Why, partly what we do is we just give European thinkers far too much credit. So the idea that anti-capitalism is Marxism, well, that's nonsense. The idea that social, uh, a social division of the needs is, is that's nonsense. That happened, this is before, right? We can have these same basic framework of ideas which are Marxist. That's what I'd say. I don't think, I think Marxism probably is too Eurocentric to keep as a, as the basis. But again, I'm not against it. It makes sense. Why not? Anyway, but, 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 but yeah, but I, don't want to do, but I know this is a really important point, because what I'm actually saying here is that look, black radicalism is a particular form of politics, and it isn't of the thing, so it isn't black Marxism. But I'm not saying black Marxism is bad necessarily. I'm just saying it's not black radicalism. That's a different project, which might be aligned in ways, and maybe it can connect, um, but it's a different project. And the first step uh, the first step has to be political education for everybody. Political education. People don't know. People don't know stuff. And this is, again, this sounds very Marxist as well, right? What's the basis of Marxism? Consciousization. People need to know, understand the conditions which they are, which they are in. Uh, that's really important. And um, organization, right? Organization. You have to have, when we talk about this organization, it has to have organization across, the, across Africa, across it, where people can be part of, and it is, uh, impro and also improving their lives. So in many ways, you hear me talk about revolution is the, is the, is the, is the key, and I do say that, but you can't just have revolution. You have to build the small steps. Uh, the, the Black Panther Party talked about survival pending revolution, right? Like, no one's going to join your organization if you're not solving the problems on their doorstep. Like, no, right? What made the Black Panther Party successful? Firstly, was they got a stop sign put up on a busy road. Then they started feeding children. Then they started doing healthcare. None of those things are revolutionary in themselves, right? So you have to do that. And no, and nobody in Zimbabwe is going to get involved in an organization that doesn't solve the problems on the day-to-day -day problems. So that's the first step as well. But that has to be tied into a much bigger political analysis as well.
right, thank you. We'll take uh, more questions. Um, anyone would like to pose one? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, so I think um, partly, thanks, Kehinde. For, for that talk, um, I think in your in your defence of uh, of Marxism, in a sense, um, it would be good to include uh, Marx's uh, view of some of the major rebellions that were taking place at the time um, of his writing, including you know the Taiping Rebellion, the the Indian Mutiny, uh, the support for the Irish, and so on. I mean, he really did sort of change his view, or his view kind of evolved over time, as, as, as you would expect, but, but he very much supported um, a lot of these rebellions, and in a sense, um, had a, a kind of coherent theory, a kind of living theory, that said, yes, the agent of change is going to be this working class, but in all its diversity, right? So that process of kind of, um, of, of workers becoming conscious of, of the, the power that they hold because of the, the, the same experience that they, that, they, that they go through across borders, the experience of exploitation, the experience of oppression, the experience of alienation, and so on. They can, to pick up uh, that woman's point up there, they can actually um, um, become increasingly conscious of the fact that if they get involved in a revolution, uh, or if they get involved in supporting other people's struggles, that they themselves will 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 benefit from that, you know. So that so that there is that um, that um, that sort of um, um, consciousness taking place, um, and so I don't think, in a sense, you can kind of write off the working class in 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 that sense. You know, the the, the working class today isn't the kind of white male, uh, you know, worker in overalls working working in the factory. It is. <laughs> often um, the black migrant woman from the global south. That, that is the kind of um, sort of epitome of, um, of the working class. So, so, te so telling a worker here, I suppose, that, well, at least you're not, you know, telling a, a, a poor person or a wor you know, working class person who's, who is really suffering in, in, uh, in, a, in a kind of relationship of exploitation that actually, well, you're, you're not as bad as, you know, you're not that bad off as, uh, as someone in Africa isn't really going to, you know, that is not going to be an empowering thing. I think the empowering thing is that how can we build bridges and alliances through mass movements across borders? And I think that's the thing that's going to be, you know, that's the sort of real empowerment. Um, thank you. The, there was one question over in the middle. Yeah. To your left. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask that just say that we do, we do get this utopia and that we all go to, to Africa and we have unity there. What do you think would be the reaction of the West, of America, of places like that? <laughs> I mean, what do you think would be the reaction when we start to, when we start to get this? And um, also, like, there's the question of those who are currently residing in Africa, though white people who are there, people of all races that are there at the moment, like what, what would their reaction be? Thank you. Hi, just a quick question. Um, I agreed like 100% with your analysis. I think it's so damn good though that I feel like it actually undermines a little bit what you say as a solution at the end. You mentioned a lot about migration and you talked about how today we're actually in a sort of a new moment rather than in 1968. And the thing that comes to my mind is climate change. And I'm from the States where right now there is a, there is a new form of class organization. It's absolutely heroic, brave, courageous, and utterly moving. A transnational um, migrant caravan from Honduras which is marching thousands of kilometers to the border of the United States. This is an anti-imperialist, um, anti-border movement. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, and if your argument is true, or I mean if, you're, if, the, if the argument that you're making is that, um, or you, the argument that you're asking us to embrace is that we're not all in the same boat. Um, I don't feel like that argument gives us the politics necessary to, to actually fight for their freedom um, and to break the border. I mean, it seems like the argument that we have to be making, and I think this is gonna be a really, really, really important question for us into the next couple of decades, is that borders destroy, people, destroy working class people on either side of them, and the only way for us to actually win is to tear them down. Um, and it seems like just that this argument ultimately lets the white ruling class, the white ruling class in the global north off the hook. 
And it seems like that was one, and you mentioned the Panthers earlier. I mean, the Panthers didn't want to move back to Africa. They wanted a Haitian revolution style in the United States. Um, and I agree, that's the only thing that's going to be necessary. Um, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, you kind of, you keep talking about this like racial hierarchy with whiteness being at the top, mm -hmm. um, blackness being at the bottom of the pyramid, and then everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of want to ask about your opinions on like blackness as a political identity as opposed to like a racial identity and how, like is, is it possible to form or how do you think coalitions with non-black people of color can happen if those people of color can sometimes conform or give in to anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we keep talking about the Black Panther Party and, and that was one of their, one of their kind of um, philosophies was forming coalition with people of what they call like the third world people mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily black Afri or African people but other people of color. Um, yeah, so just your thoughts on that. You. Also, you didn't answer the development question. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was the question? What was the question? So, in the other round, there was one on like Africa and Europe um, and development. Oh, yeah, it was up there. You know, I wrote it up here. That's why. Yeah, I didn't see. Thank you. Um, over there, yeah. Hi, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm a British Brazilian, and um, Brazil, you haven't really talked about um, South America. Yeah. Um, I'm quite interested, Brazil's like massively complex, yeah. very unequal, um, and I just wanted to hear what you thought about, um, it's related to what this guy said, uh, kind of racial consciousness. Um, it's something that is like super complex in Brazil, and I'm kind of thinking about how do you get people who consider themselves white, which is a really bizarre term in itself in Brazil, um, to, be, to, to be part of this fight, as it were, because this is, this is everyone's fight, certainly for most liberal people. And I think that it's convincing, in somewhere like Brazil, convincing the white, the white people that they need, that this is something to even start to think about. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you spoke earlier of, um, of a system perpetuating and being built on a system of oppression and exploitation. Um, if you do not sort of agree or see a, a Marxist communism working, what sort of alternative political and economic system do you imagine? Thank you. Um, yeah, right. thanks. Uh, thanks for talk. I, I, I agree with the vast majority of what you said. However, um, just picking on a few points. So, for example, you said that you don't you don't really identify as a Jamaican simply because like Jamaica is massively like you know it's not really home for Africans. It's a place where people were taken to in chains. Um, in the same way, you know, I sort of believe that the black race is sort of a construct of the white man. And so, how do you think you can motivate you know a mass of black people? Um, to something that's entirely a construct, where, you know, sort of authors like Chinua Chebi say that, you know, tribe is the most authentic form of identity for Africans. So how do you think that, you know, the indigenous population in Africa will accept <coughs> and allow assimilation of, like, a mass of black people who have no idea about their ancestry, their tribe, um, when they come back to Africa, which is just essentially your solution? Mm -hmm. All right, I better ask the answer. I'm going to forget what it is. All right. Yeah, so back to the first question, which is a long time ago, so I'm going to do my best. Um, yeah, no, again, like I said, so you're right. Like, look, Marxism and the left in general has said some good things about rebellion. Certainly, right? Like, in theory, is it not, in theory it's, it's very good. Like, like I said, I quote neo Marxists, Marxists a lot of the time, right? Um, but I do think, I, I guess empowering. So this thing was, is it empowering to tell somebody that they're not, that they're in a different class, that they're, they're in a different fight? Probably not, but I guess that's the point, right? Like I think partly one of the things I'm trying to push in the book is that these conversations are supposed to be uncomfortable. And they're, 
realizing that actually you get your wealth from the exploitation of other people is uncomfortable. That has to be had. That has to be said. Like, what, so one of the stories in the book, actually, in the black, there's a whole chapter about black Marxism because of this. And it opens up with, I was at um, an event in Birmingham, Black History Month event, and there was a strike taking place in South Africa, farm workers, and the Socialist Workers Party always come to black events. Forget the, forget the police and the spies. It's always Socialist Workers Party. Always there. Always there. I'm surprised there's not somebody from a Socialist, work, socialist Workers Party here today. No? Oh, that's the <laughs> Usually they're here. All right. So, <laughs> anyway. And they were making this case that the, the strikes for teachers' pensions at the same time in Britain were the same fight as a strike for South African farm workers. That's completely, that's a ludicrous statement. Where do teachers get their money from? Taxation. Where, does tech, where do we get a large part of our taxation? A political and economic system which, which, which impoverishes those South African farm workers. If you want to explain why they're so poor, it's because of the taxes, but part of the money that's raised from taxes that pays teachers' pensions, right? So actually, you're actually in contradiction. These are contradictory movements because what the teachers are arguing for is a better share of the exploitation of those South African farm workers. Now, that might not be empowering, but it is true, right? And you have to have that conversation to understand what does the real, what does the real political connection look like? If you want to build a meaningful political connection, right? So I guess that's that's what I said. Uh, what's the reaction of the West? The West will be terrible. Oh my God! Like it'd be awful. Like we saw, we already saw what the reaction of the West would be to Pan-Africanism. It's just died killing a lot of people, right? Um, so that's why one, you have to have a proper organisation that doesn't rely on individuals. Two, that is actually one of the reasons why the diaspora is really important in this struggle. It's more difficult to do the terrible things the West would want to do with millions of us in America, millions of us in Britain millions of us here, because you actually have a power base. That's why, actually, moving straight to Africa, that's the wrong thing, right? Because you need to have some kind of power base here to disrupt what will happen, and it will definitely happen. This is one of the other reasons why China's more dangerous, because there ain't that many of us in China. Like, like you don't have that power base, right? Whereas here, you have a, a stronger power base. But no, we know, we know what will happen. It, will be de it, will be, it won't be good. Um, I guess the thing about, I said, like, in this political framework, the United States, people, in the United States isn't the solution at all. Like, it's not. It's not going to be the place where revolution happens. It's not going to be the place uh, where the change happens. So I guess I just disagree. Like, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I, I mean, does it left, does it left, does it leave the West off the hook? No, I don't know. It's just saying, look, I just don't, I can't see this, just understanding what this, what the nature of the system is. I think we have to understand that the rev even even black black masters makes this basic argument is that revolution happens elsewhere, right? Because that's where their conditions are, and their conditions aren't really here. And what will happen here, and what has happened here, and will happen here again, right? So, the welfare state happens because inequality gets too big, and then you know people aren't stupid, so they know they're just terrified of revolution, so they give you a welfare state, right? So this is what will happen in Britain. Like, this will happen in the West. There'll be a crisis. There'll be poverty. There'll be people, got, and then there'll be a, there'll be a resetting where you get some more tax, you get some more benefits, you get some more, and that will probably be enough to buy off the masses of people. And even those people migrate in here. I mean, we're the worst. We're still the worst people. Jeez, we migrate here and then make the same arguments, right? I just need a better standard of living. And now you've got black people saying, "I'm not pro Eastern European migration. Let's forget the migrants. We're British. Let's forget the migrants." So we tie into that as well. I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Blackness, non-black, blackness, non-black, what's the blackness? The blackness, non-blackness question, um, how do you have unity across the third world? Well, I think that's important, but again, and I think if you actually look at the black radical movements, who are the ones who have made those connections, who went to Bandung, uh, who was part of the third world movement, this was pan African. This was, this was black radicals. So why am I pro-Palestine? It's because I embrace black radicalism, because it shows you a way of understanding the world. So and then once you understand the world that way, you, of course you're going to be, you have to be pro of the movements, friend. It's absolutely essential. Um, but again, the independence part of it is important because anti-blackness is a real thing. And it is a real route to prosperity for some other place. So you can't just rely on that. It's not just because people are white that they will exploit you. Yeah, it's it, Arab slave trade. That was the first slave trade, right? Um, do you need, there's a question about European development. Do you need a European development model? No, no, no. And it's a lot of these things we think about as being European. Democracy, for example, is that really European? Like, are we sure it's European? Uh, math, science, I'm sure. I, 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 when you go to Egypt, you got these pyramids, which are a huge, a huge, which are, what else are the pyramids but one of the most marvels of science and mathematics that ever existed? The idea that's European, is not, that's crazy, right? Because clearly these things came, came before Europe even possibly existed. Uh, so I don't think you need a European framework. You need a different, you need a different, a different framework. 
Great to be. Uh, Brazil, yeah, Brazil is really, I mean, Brazil is a place where the, mo the country where the most enslaved Africans went by a distance, about 40% of enslaved Africans went to Brazil. Massively important uh, in terms of diaspora. Uh, and Brazil had Universal Negro Improvement Association chapters. Um, Afro-Brazilian Afro, Afro politics is really a, is, is a growing thing as well in Brazil. Uh, I, d I guess I just disagree that you need the white people. I don't, know. I don't think you do. I don't know. But again, I'm not against allies. Allies are, allies are good. Allies are, allies are always good. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, no, I think that, and especially somewhere like Brazil, Brazil has I mean, Brazil is the country with the most black people in it, as, uh, apart from Nigeria. So you see, you have a mass population of people who really could do something very different and change. I and mean, black radicalism in Brazil is a real possibility. It's, it's the majority of people, right? Which could fundamentally change uh, many things in that country. Uh, alternative economic system. I guess the difference is I don't. When when I talk when we talk about share, shared resources and socializing the wealth, definitely that's not common. That that communism embraces those ideas, but you can have those ideas without Marxism and without communism. In fact, those ideas existed pre prior to Marxism and communism. So I think what the exact economics and political framework looks like, I cannot tell you, but I shouldn't be able to tell you because you can only really develop that through the process of putting it together, right? And those are the next set of questions we should be asking. And the final question was about, well, look, blackness is not a concept of white people. Take that away 100%. There's a whole chapter on the book on blackness. Blackness is our thing. You think when, when Europeans walked into Africa, do you not think that we went, you look different? Like really, like really, at a real level. Of course we went, you look different, of course you, course you look different, right? Now, at that point, there's different ways of how that difference gets interpreted. The European way of that is race. It's the Negro. It's we're inferior. It's we're substandard. Then they create this idea of the Negro. And the Negro is that social construction that we aren't really people, we haven't got civilization, etc. So that's the Negro, right? Our response to the Negro is blackness, actually. It's for us to say, well, look, this means something. This is meaningful. This, this is a connection that we embrace that is actually anti-European ideas of race. It's not about genetics. It's not about superiority, inferiority. It's about how this thing connects us together into a political project. So I would always say blackness, and it's not always been called blackness. It's been called Africa. It can be called different things. But this idea that, there, there's so, that this brings us together, that we're part of something cohesive and collective, um, is not a European, it's not a European idea at all. This is the basis of radical collectivity. This is the basis says that we are that global diaspora. And has been really influential on the African continent. Uh, so Garveyism is one of the most important political projects in Africa, even though Marcus Garvey never went to Africa. But look at the flags of Ghana, the flag of Kenya, the flag of Namibia, the flag of... Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's another country in Southern Africa. My country, I'm forgetting my countries. But look, anytime you see red, black, and green on any flag, or you see a black star on any flag, that's Garveyism. I mean, Garvey is hugely important. So the idea, this is just like a, Euro, like a diaspora thing that's been there. It's not true. It's really not true. These ideas, um, when in the Kenyan, Kenyan, Kenyan revolution, uh, they would take the Negro world, which is a Garvey paper. Garvey was gone by then. And they would run from village to village, reading out this paper in the different tribal languages. Right? Massively important. These ideas are hugely important on the African continent. And I think, and when I've gone and talked to, this is not the elite. Anytime I've gone and talked to just regular people in Africa, they get it. They understand. They know. Because they, they, they come on, do you understand what's happening to you? And you understand what's happening. So I think there, it's not simple, right? Because obviously things like tribe, tribe, for example, is, a, is, a, is one of the barriers to this, right? Because if you have a tribe, that, that's, that suggests you're not the same, you're not connected, right? And Nkrumah is a good example of this, uh, where Nkrumah understands that tribal leaders are hugely important. So works that way, Pan-Africanism, which incorporates tribalism. I'm not sure how, but you know, no one's saying you should. No, I'm not definitely not saying you should. You have to get rid of tribe and get rid of your ethnic identity. But see it as an ethnic identity, right? You can have your tribe, but our political identity is different, right? And in many ways, it's no different to Europe. France is a tribe. Britain is a tribe. America is a tribe. But on the basic political identity. This whiteness, right? And they do it very well. And they essentially agree on basically everything. Even at times, and this is a point, even at times when they're at war. So think about France and Britain, who were the major slave trade, two of the major slave trading nations competing, having wars during slavery, right? Um, massively competition. And you could say, oh, completely different, not a system. But at the time when Britain, when Britain and France were actually having wars over slave colonies, half of all of the 
enslaved Africans on Bri on, in French plantations were, came on British ships. French slavery could not have survived without Britain at the same time that Britain and France are fighting. That's the kind of unity we're talking about. You can have your tribe, you can have, your, you can have wars, but you basically agree on the central premise and that's how you build your unity. And that's, why is that not possible in Africa? Partly because we have kind of this idea that all oh, tribes are so central to African people, you can't possibly, it's, cause it's kind of a savage idea, right? That we, that's how we are, we're so fundamentally tribal that we can't possibly go past that and have, have unity across something else, right? Which is fundamentally not true, I would say. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are um, out of time, but you're welcome to ask more questions um, afterwards. Um, any final comments, would you? Uh, no, we just want to get a book, get a book, I sign it, you know. Yeah. Go with yeah. Let's thank the speaker <laughs> for... Um, <laughs>